Staples Nursery in Santa Ana, and this morning's topic is winter pruning on fruit trees. So the now there's a you know in nature there's nobody to prune the fruit trees. Fruit trees generally do not need to be pruned to produce. We do it for two or three reasons. One reason is to keep them within picking height. Because nobody wants to climb a ladder anymore. It's just too hard to get up there and too dangerous. So to keep them short, you need to prune them. Now, there are in the, in the fruit tree world some dwarfs. But there's not many of them. And, there's not, and especially the quality of a lot of the dwarf fruit trees isn't very good. Like we've never come across a dwarf a genetically dwarf peach tree that was anywhere close to the best peach you can eat or a genetically dwarf nectarine or you know and so on so we have to get the trees that are full size in the most parts and keep them small uh, in the citrus world there are dwarfing rootstocks but the growers aren't using them <clears throat> the retail growers aren't using them because they're too slow so most of the citrus out there that are shorter than standards are called semi-dwarf, but at most it'll dwarf them a foot or two, which is, you know, if you're talking about a 15-foot orange tree, semi-dwarf is only like 12 foot. It's, it's still too tall. So still you're left with pruning them. Um, the other reason we prune them is to make a more productive and better quality fruit. And the third reason now is it seems that all the research has shown that even though you can get more fruit on a tree, you get more fruit per square foot on fruit trees that are no wider than five feet. So five feet is kind of like the maximum production on a fruit tree per square foot. And the reason for that is if it's, let's say, you know, the five foot would be about two and a half foot all around, that's two and a half foot of solid leaves. The sunlight can't penetrate much deeper than that. So if you have a 10 foot wide fruit tree, the inside five foot of it pretty much is not fruiting. Just the outer, outer shell of two and a half foot of, of foliage can make fruit. So all the orchards are, if you go to a modern orchard, they're getting smaller and smaller. The fruit trees are getting smaller, closer together. Um, or being grown in a different form that allows more sunlight, like a spalliard on a wire, so that there's not so much dense, uh, you know, unproductive growth. That's the main thing. And the nice thing for homeowners is that keeping fruit trees smaller, you can get more of them in your yard. The other thing about it is that if you let a so say a peach tree grow full size, which is 20 foot wide and 12 foot tall, 15 foot tall. The ripens in two weeks, that's about 500 pieces of fruit. You got two weeks to eat it or give it away. If it's only five foot wide and say seven or eight foot tall, you're probably below 100 pieces of fruit. And you can, your family can probably eat that, but uh, a full-size peach tree, there's no way. It's a neighborhood thing. You have to give it away to your neighborhood. So with smaller trees, you can also have you know, more varieties and more harvest periods. So like one peach tree, all fruit in two weeks. If you have five peach trees, you can choose them so that you can fill the two-week periods from, say, May through July and have peaches over a longer period instead of eating them all at once. So that's another reason to keep trees small. Now, a uh, little bit of basics on pruning. Plants grow, let me show you how, essentially plants grow this way. So usually as they grow, every year they make a new layer. So if you have a small tree, the next year, another layer grows on top of it and may send out branches. So trees have the rings because they're layered like that. So it's like a tree inside the tree as they grow. Now plants don't heal like animals do. So if you cut yourself, you can cut yourself pretty deep. It'll heal totally, well, if you're healthy, 
uh, that wound will heal totally and you're good as new. I mean, there's no difference between pre-cut and post-cut. Plants don't heal wounds. They wall them off and put new growth on top of them. So if you make a cut into a tree this deep, that cut's going to be there the entire life of that tree. What it'll do is it'll seal the area around the cut, but this area is all worthless to the tree. It's dead. And as it grows, it makes a new layer on top of the cut area that eventually closes up as the tree grows. And sometimes they'll even put extra wood on top of the wounded area just to make it stronger there. So as the tree grows, it covers the wounded area up, but it's always in there. So if your tree breaks and you stake it up, that break is always going to be there. So just be aware of that. If a tree, you know, if a big branch breaks and you try to stake it back up, uh, usually it takes about two or three years for a fairly thick branch to make enough new wood that the, the break is not going to be a weak spot in the tree. Now, generally, what we also stopped doing about 30 years ago, we stopped painting wounds. So in the old days, every time they prune a tree, they said, oh, it's proper to put something on there to seal it. Well, what the forest department figured out is that when you cut into a plant or a plant breaks or anything, they seal themselves at the moment that break occurs. Within a fraction of a second, they, they know it's cut. I don't know how they know because they have no nerves, but they seal that wound with a plug around it. Now some plants seal better than others. Um, they've been doing tests on trees for generations now to see what the pruning damage does. And it's interesting in the fruit fa family of fruit trees you have the best sealing tree known in the world are apple trees. You cut those, they seal right at the cut. And one of the worst ones known peach trees. So you, can, you cut a peach tree and a lot, sometimes they don't seal at all. They'll just lose, they'll let all this wood rot below the cut area. They don't seal it. So a lot of people have seen like stone fruit trees in general aren't good sealing trees and peach is among the worst. So a lot of people see their peach tree one year full of fruit, then it just falls over, broken, and then all the inside's totally hollow or totally termite eaten. The plant didn't seal it. All the wounds that you make when you prune them were kill, essentially killing the trunk. And so you have uh, all this dead wood inside the tree and it's done. Now, just as a side note, termites do not damage trees. So termites, in the plant world, termites are good. Um, fungus is bad. So what termites do is they see dead wood and they clean it out. And the tree would rather have the termites clean it out because termites don't eat living tissue. They eat dead tissue. So the termites cleaning out the dead wood, the fungus doesn't have as good a chance to get in there and, and really cause havoc. So they said in a, in a, in a tree's lifetime, termites are almost essential to keep the tree living longer. It's not good for our houses, but for plants in general, termites prolong their life. So termites are essential in, in for long-lived trees to have them around. So among uh, fruit trees and, or and orchards, peach and nectarine orchards are usually kept in operation for about 13 years. They did statistics. So they used to keep them in operation for 25 years at the point at which they fell apart. Nowadays, when there was statistical analysis, they said, well, after its 12th year, well, even beyond 10 years, the production is starting to go downhill. And by the 13th year, there's no reason to keep that tree. Its production's going down because of all the, the wounding, all the dead areas of the trunk, and then they replace them with another type of tree. Whereas apple orchards, they're in production for 100, 100 years, 150 years. Uh, they don't go downhill unless you stop watering them. So those are the kind of the two extremes 
Uh, most fruit trees, according to the research, do make their best production probably in the first generation. First 25 years, most productive. Beyond that, they start sliding downhill. Now the way you're supposed to prune a branch For fruit trees, it's not incredibly important to prune branches properly. And if you have a, sh a big 80-foot shade tree in your front yard, you want to make sure that, sure that thing's pruned properly. Because if a branch is pruned, pruned wrong and it, and it gets weak and it breaks off, you can kill somebody. Fruit trees, you know, a branch dies and breaks because you prune wrong, no, no big deal. It's not that big a deal. But if you want to do the, the pruning most proper way you can, um, these are the landmarks on a branch and a tree. So these trees are a little bit young, but you can kind of still make out what I'm drawing here on young trees. But on an old tree, this is very, very easy to see, especially this time of year. So, where a branch connects to the trunk, there's a little ridge line that forms between the where the, the in the crotch of the that area, and that's the bark from this branch. And it's like the branch is almost a different plant than the trunk. They're competing with each other. So the bark forming on this branch and the bark forming in the trunk collide and make this ridge line. So that's called the branch bark ridge. Not important, but it's you'll see that ridge. So all the bark from this branch is from here this way. All the bark from this tree kind of ends like that. Well, it crosses over. Actually, the no, it doesn't. I think, you know, I'm not sure what the bark, but the we know the, the bark and the wood from this branch. I gotta go back just a little bit here. So if inside a branch or the trunk, it's all the same, you've got what is called the cambium layer. That's the area that the plant grows. And what it does, it makes cells that go two directions. The cells that are going toward the inside make tissue called xylem. And that's how the plants transport water from the roots upwards. So they go, it's on the inside of the cambium layer. On the outside, you have cells that make the phloem, and that's the bark of a tree. And the bark of the tree transports what the leaves make back down to the roots. So the xylem water up water and fertilizer from the soil up to the leaves, and then the phloem whatever the tree's making goes back down. So the bark is on the outside and the xylem or heartwood is on the inside. Um, as the tree grows, the phloem ha is getting, you know, it, it's at a disadvantage because it's being stretched. So on some trees, the bark just peels off in sections. On other trees, it cracks into big pieces. You, know, you got this crack bark. Uh, so there are several ways you can do it. Some trees stretch, but most trees either strip off the bark every year or they crack and form deep fissures as it grows because this is, you know, the outside of this is smaller. So the bark collides there. The heartwood on the inside of this thing doesn't go above that line and it kind of mixes with the wood from the trunk. The wood from the trunk kind of goes out to here and then it goes back down. And they're kind of streamers going down, they're not solid pieces. So that's how they intermingle. So if you want to cut off this branch, you don't want to touch any of the wood. So if you go back 60 years ago, they used to do flush cuts 
which were just right through this area here because they said the bark would heal over that area faster. The problem was is they were cutting the wood of this trunk too and so they were getting a lot of dieback and dead wood in this area because they went too deep. So now we know that if you don't want to touch the wood of the tree, just mess up the branch, you have to start at the bridge, the bark branch ridge there and actually the angle is supposed to be equal to the angle of the bark branch ridge. So you're supposed to go out at this angle and cut like that. So these two are similar angles because the wood of the trunk actually goes out that far. If you want to take this branch off, you cut it there. Now, if you wanted to lower your tree and cut this off, you cut it right along the branch bark ridge. Because then you won't touch any of the wood coming down here. And you don't want to leave a stub because then it regrows. So we have uh, a moringa tree. It's growing like crazy. And last year we cut it up at the top. Like That's fine. Moringas aren't, are just kind of almost herbaceous trees. They're not, they don't get that big if you cut it wrong. This is, this again, this is critical if you have a shade tree that's going to go 80 foot, a branch breaks off, you kill somebody. Moringa trees, if the branch breaks off, nothing happens. You don't, no one dies. Uh, the tree recovers from that. It's not that big a deal. So for most of the trees we're working with today, except for maybe the mulberry, proper pruning isn't all that essential. Yeah, it's better, you know, for the plant's health and the structure, it's better to take it down to a lower branch if you have one. Because this branch has already got layers and layers of wood build up. It's strong. See, one of the problems we have on shade trees, if you just top it here, there's nothing to prevent that from regrowing. This branch is sending down a lot of hormones that will prevent, if you cut it right along this line, nothing grows off of that wound because this branch has taken over the top of the tree. But if you just cut it like this, there's nothing here stopping. All these hormones here are allowing new branches to grow. The problem with the new growth is this tree so powerful that they'll try to put on a huge branch with one layer of bark and wood connecting it. So this branch connection is really weak. There's so much strength here, it wants to grow the top back on one year, old, one year of wood. <laughs> it's not very strong. So on a big tree, if you top them, that new growth goes back 20 foot in one year and the wind just takes and snaps it off. Uh, it takes about three or four years for the wood to build up thick enough to hold that one on, whereas this has already got its support system here. You cut it right here, it's not going to break off all of a sudden and it won't, it won't try to regrow the top real fast either. So, so if you want to do a perfect job on your plants, you cut it either there or like that. Well, hopefully you've got, on this tree, you've got branches already over here that'll do that for you. But sometimes, if it's, it depends on the plant. Some plants are so good at sprouting new growth. Um, I'm trying to think of one that does. There's certain apples that they just sprout everywhere, but certain plants don't re-sprout at all. And, you know, the worst ones are pine trees. You cut it, you cut the leaves off a pine tree it never grows back. Pines, uh, they only grow where there's still needles attached. So, and some, there's some other plants like that too, but most of the fruit trees are pretty forgiving. Well, what he's talking about is if you have, so on shade trees, Generally what they want on a shade tree is the branches to be going, you know, you want the central trunk, I mean ideally on a shade tree, 
one central trunk it's stronger and then the branch is going outwards between I think it's 27 degrees and well let's just make it 30. 30 degrees above horizontal and 30 degrees less than vertical. That range there is the right range to have a branch. If you have a branch going horizontally there it starts sprouting straight up. All the new growth it starts doing that. It stops, you know, when branches go flat, they don't grow this way anymore. They start to try to go this way. If the branch is like this, it'll continue growing outwards. You don't want it to compete with the trunk, so you don't want it too vertical. So you want it somewhere on a shade, this is again shade trees, you want it somewhere between about 30 degrees and that'd be 60 degrees. And that's the, that's the, you know, that's that perfect zone where it doesn't water spout, make new site, new branches that want to become central leader or trunks. And it can still grow. Okay, let's see. Yes. Well, on a espalier tree, you want the branch to be flat so it doesn't grow f too far. If you want it to continue growing, you tilt the end up and it'll grow longer and then you can lay it down as it grows. And that'll get all these side buds opening up. And then you'll get fruit. And then you keep trimming them. Not, don't let them get too long because they'll sometimes on a young apple tree, they'll want to grow like 10 foot straight up. So you just keep clipping, clipping, clipping all summer long. In the fall, those branches where the leaves are will make flower buds right there and then you'll get fruit there the next year. You've got to keep clipping them for a while. They, they tend to want to become trunks again. So you just clip, clip them, but the leaves that are on that you leave in the fall will make flower buds, and then you get fruit there. Next year you might have to clip them again to keep them that size. You know, they don't want them to go, say, more than six inches above the horizontal. Um, within a few years they stop trying to become trunks, and, you'll just, and you want to do as much pruning, but uh, for a while, these things want to become a trunk, so just keep clipping them. But clip them. So on fruit trees, um, most fruit trees, as they're growing, they don't make any flower buds in spring or summer, most of them. But they, in the fall, they stop growing, and whatever leaves get the most sunlight make the flower bud. So on a branch like this, like on a branch heading straight up, the only leaves that are getting the most sunlight are the top, the ones at the very tip. So if the branch is vertical, you just get fruits forming at the top. If the branch is horizontal, you can see on this fairly horizontal branch, they started making a lot of little side branches. And each side branch had leaves on it. They're making little flower buds all along the side now. So on a horizontal branch, you get almost every single node there making fruit. On this one, it's just going to be the very tip of that branch because it's pointing upwards. So generally, you want branches on a fruit tree to, you know, in theory now, on most fruit trees, one vertical or fewer verticals. I mean, there's no rules on this. You can have a lot of vertical trunks. Just know that none of those produce fruit. And then everything else be fairly horizontal and then you get better fruit production. Yeah, my fruit production's been interesting because it, it's had real tiny, like, crabapple ones and, and full-size ones. Yeah, so the small ones are, they never develop. Well, on fruit, fruit trees, too, you've got to thin them out and make sure there's only one apple in each cluster and make sure the clusters are no, not any closer together than about six inches. So like this branch potentially can make, you know, each one of these buds here can make five apples. So this branch here can make 40 or 50 apples if they all do their thing. It's just way too many. This should be only about two or three apples on this branch. So as, they, as soon as you see the fruit about the size of your thumbnail, time to start thinning them out so that there's not so much fruit in one branch. 
they found out on Fuji apple trees, you know, the, when Fuji's first came out in the 80s, the growers were so greedy that they wanted the trees to produce a lot because they're making a lot of money on those. And they're selling really tasteless apples for about 10 years. And the, uh, the university decided, told them, you know, you got to uh, thin your apples better so that the fruit has some taste, or I don't know, the Apple Association, whatever it was, because you're selling these apples and no one will buy because they're totally tasteless. So they found out that the maximum number of fruit on the Fuji apple tree should be one apple for every 27 leaves. So somebody actually counted leaves and counted fruit and see what it took to make uh, uh, a good Fuji apple. And they said one apple for every 27 leaves. Well, I find when you pull apples off, sometimes you pull the entire cluster off. So it's better to trim them. But just make sure you clean your pruners because you can transmit uh, fungus diseases. Uh, bleach is better. So I, yeah, I trim them. I pulled enough clusters off by, if you're real careful, you just grab the stem and then yank the fruit off the stem and that's okay. Instead of trying to yank the whole stem off because sometimes you pull the cluster with it. Okay, so this is when you, now, Okay, so there's another way to, another thing to note is that you take any branch and you clip the end off of a young branch. Generally what happens is the last three or four buds, growth buds open up so you get more branches. So that's called a, you know, the, so you cut a, a single branch to a, and leave a stub, then it, you get a whole bunch of branches next year. If you want to thin out a branch, then you cut it all the way off down to the <clears throat> that area there, and then it won't grow. And then that, that's called a thinning cut, where you cut all the way back to the next branch, and nothing grows, and you leave a gap. But if you want to make it bushier, you leave the end of the stem there, and usually the last or for buds open up, and you get a bushier if you want to make more branches. Right, it does. It uh, depends on how much fruit you, know, fruit you want and how full your tree is already. If it's just a single trunk, yeah, definitely cut it back. Okay, so those are some general rules. Again, we don't treat wounds anymore. Uh, they seal themselves. There's some, still some traditional arborists out there that like to, to paint their wounds. But um, generally, you don't have to. Now, we mentioned on apples, uh, there are some diseases. And on all fruit trees, uh, except, well, I don't know of any on figs, but on peaches, on apples, on all the stone fruits, there are some diseases out there that you can transmit by your pruner blade. So at least between trees, or if you see definitely a diseased area, like it's all, the stem's all black, you cut that, then it's nice to clean your blade off with bleach, 10% bleach. Flame works too, but you can mess up your metal if it gets too hot, so. I guess boiling water would do it too. So most uh, commercially, they usually clean their pruners off between trees, just to make sure they don't transmit disease from tree to tree. We didn't really have that many diseases out here a long time ago, but, and mainly because we didn't have that many fruit trees in Orange County. You know, we didn't have a lot of peach trees or apple trees back in the 70s because we didn't think they would grow here. But now that we do, all the diseases that are among the orchards in the Central Valley have followed them down. So we do have to be a little more careful now on, on keeping our tools clean and all that. Okay, let's start with Generally, um, peaches and nectarines require the most pruning for a good crop. So they'll, they'll fruit, you know, each of these buds along the stem are flower buds. This is a peach tree. This is a peach tree.
Well, there's another reason for that. Most peaches don't fruit here. So on all, all stone fruit, they have what is called a minimum chill requirement. Uh, and if you don't get cold enough in the winter, they don't fruit. So, uh, right. So that's, that's common. If what they found, what the University of California found, because they planted a bunch of fruit trees at the Irvine Field Station, and they found out the best producers have the lousiest fruit, and the lousiest producers had the better quality fruit, and that's the dilemma we have here, is that the best peaches need more cold than we normally get, so they don't fruit as much. There are some, there are some really good low-chill peaches, though, and we do sell them. Um, so you choose your, your crop wisely. So on a peach tree, what they found, now, okay, I go back one step. So in the old days, peach trees looked like this. So they, you planted them, you cut them off at knee height, train out the branches, train out the branches, train out the branches. And what they told the orchards to do is you want 16 verticals. And off those 16 vertical stems, everything else you want to be horizontal. But now that they know that peach trees are best in their first 10 or 12 years of production, they said, forget making this, because it takes five years to do that. Uh, you, lo you lost half your production life by training it to a big tree. So now most oral peach orchards only do two to four verticals, and that's it because they don't want to waste the tree's time making more. And I'm telling my customers, one, just do one vertical. Because the one vertical, yeah, leave the central, instead of taking it out. In Canada, they, use, they do the single stem because, well, Canada, the growing season's shorter, so they don't have time to do all this either. Uh, now, the one reason in California they go with two or four Sometimes one is too vigorous. It just keeps on wanting to grow too fast. The branches get too long. So it's a matter of trimming. Just trim, trim, trim to keep them to that size. Because really, you know, you'll get twice as much fruit with two, but do you need that much? I think one, one trunk like this, this can easily make, you know, on a branch this long, five fruit times how many branches it has. That's a lot of fruit already on just one trunk. So let's go with that, but you'll have to do some trimming because these can get really long since, they're, since it's so strong. Um, now what you want on each side of the tree, you want to space the branches out. Um, and you only want these branches to fruit for one year. So this is, I think it's University of Pennsylvania figured all this out. They said the best fruit on a peach and nectarine tree are on uh, first year branches that are between, they grew between 12 inches, like this is about a 12 inch branch, and 24 inches long. If it grew much bigger than that, a lot of times it doesn't have any flower buds in there because it's got too many side branches coming off that branch. So, so you don't use those, you just save, and they want them to be spaced, you know, you can divide your tree into four sides, or you can do six sides or eight sides, whatever you want to do. So let's say this is one side. You can see here is branch here, branch here, branch here, branch here, branch here. They're too close together. They want about a foot distance between branches. We'll, we'll cheat a little bit and say, okay, I'll, I'll save this one, this one, and that one, and get rid of the two in between. But you don't cut them totally off. You leave stubs. And then say this one's, well, there's nothing in here, so we'll leave this one here, but there's two choices here. Um, I'll probably just go with the little one and then go up here. This one's too short. And then we'll save, we'll hopefully maybe save this one to be that next one. Now, as during the middle of the year, this branch is a little bit kind of vertical what you can do is tie it down and the, now it's, it's fine, it's got plenty of flower buds on it, but if you want to make sure during the summer you can tie this down uh, so it's a little more horizontal, a little bit better sun exposure on the leaves and you'll get your flower buds better. 
they used to say tie weights on them, but they said, oh, that's kind of dangerous in the wind. So now they put a stake in the ground and tie them down a little bit. So we cut the ones you don't want shorter because what happens next year, this will fruit along, along this branch and you'll thin out the fruit so there's only one peach every six or eight inches. But during the time of when it's fruiting, it'll grow another two feet and have side branches. So next year, this won't be your branch you want. Hopefully, this stub here will regrow into the right size. And then you can cut this one short and leave that one long. So you're trading branches on each side of the tree. Say, okay, I want this branch, this branch, this branch this year, this branch. This one's probably going to be far enough. We'll stub that one. And what time of year did you say it's best for fruiting trees? Well, you do this work in the winter. Summertime, you're cutting the top of the tree down to keep it shorter. Or you're, you know, if the branch is getting way long, you, didn't, you can trim it back a bit so it's not so long. Can you also cut it now? Well, if you cut, well, we'll go over that. Yes. What you're talking about now applies to peaches? And nectarines. Nectarines, not No. The peaches, nectarines need the most work. So, for best, you know, if you don't prune them at all, you'll still get fruit. They'll just be smaller. So this is this is really a commercial thing that they do. But if you want your best quality fruit, this is how you do it. So you you know hold the hold, hold this branch down. This branch is about a foot away, so that's fine. And then that one there. And then you go to another side of the tree and you do the same thing on all sides of your tree, how many, however many sides you're working with. It can be, you know, four sides, five sides, six sides, eight sides. How old a tree are you talking about? Uh, I got one here, third season. So it's still only, you know, maybe five feet. You still do the same thing? All its life, yeah. You want to do this same thing the tree's entire life, yeah. So just keep trading branches. See, otherwise the tree's got to grow a new branch every year to get to get make flowers and fruit. And so you're stuck. The tree gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You try to keep it cut back so that uh, uh, it doesn't get too big, but you're left with all this dead wood in the middle that's not fruiting anymore. So you just have shorter and shorter branches as you keep cutting the tree back to eight foot, say. Um, all your new growth is at the tip, and then you just get very short branches after that. So you, it's nice to take them all the way off, but leave some gaps here so they can regrow. So, so if you have like a older tree, peach tree that's never been pruned really, you just should just aggressively prune it way back to two and a half feet. That may kill it. Well, go with what you have, see what you can do with it. You might be able to prune it to a lower branch and work with that one, but you know sometimes you can't really do much if the trunk is that big and you, all your branches are way up there, then you cut it back to here. It, it, it will regrow, but it might die the same year from the big wound. <laughs> so you can try that. Well, you can try stumping it. If that's all you can do, stump it and see if it, if it lives a few years after you stump it. You might get some crops. Because so. uh, the damage to the trunk really has nothing to do with the fruiting. The branches are still healthy. It's just the trunk that's losing its wood, and eventually that kills it just as the fact that you stumped it. So it sounds so. like before you are saying if it's reached that point, just take it out, would you then, would it be okay to plant another peach tree Well, that's a good subject too. So any fruit tree, uh, you pull it out, any related fruit tree is gonna do real poorly in the same dirt for the next 10 years, but there's a way around that. So I met a guy who worked in an apple orchard and they said, yeah, now and then they would run over a tree with the truck accidentally. So they would, his job was to dig it out, dig out three foot of dirt, one and a half foot deep, dig another hole, a distance, farther distance from any apple tree, and then re and switch the soil. Because wherever the apple tree was, that's full of 
apple roots and if you kill the tree now it's full of dying apple roots and any apple tree put in the middle of that baby apple tree put in the middle of that sees all this dead relatives all around it it just sulks and doesn't grow at all I did this when I was in the 1980s I took out a beautiful apple tree put a new one in its place it actually got smaller for three years and then it leveled off and started to grow but never got to the size of the original apple tree so I've seen that it's called the apple replant syndrome but in every plant we know of it's the same problem you leave the roots of that plant all its relatives will hate that spot if it's unrelated so if you took out an apple tree put a peach tree in peach tree doesn't give a darn about that there's dead apple roots in the ground it loves it it's not related so but if it is related you can put now they you know the interesting thing is they did a lot of testing so they found out that it's better to put a new apple tree in an old orchard with new dirt than it actually is to plant a new orchard they said the because the tree was surrounded by its relatives as soon as it could it joined roots with its relatives and became a faster growing tree than it would have been if it was all by itself in a new orchard so so that was interesting that they did that part too and they said the worst thing they did is they put the old soil in a new orchard and planted the new tree in that old soil in the new orchard it didn't do a thing it didn't grow at all so get the old soil out. right get the soil with the dying roots out of there if it's a related plant Well, they said a three foot wide by one and a half foot deep hole gives you a 10 by 10 foot tree within a few years. Uh, so it depends how big you want that. You know, if you don't, if you only want your tree to grow six by six, then a two by two hole would probably be big enough. Like one of my employees who was a rose um, expert, a rosarian, he would replace roses every year. He found out that only one cubic foot of soil one by one by one foot deep was enough to get a gorgeous rose back in the same spot. If he didn't do that, then the rose would be, you know, would, would be stunted also. So just don't mix it. You want it just pure, clean dirt in that hole. And among what we sell, our top pot would be the proper soil to use if you didn't want to dig a hole somewhere else. Top pot, pure sand will work as a soil substitute. Okay, so this is peaches and nectarines. Um, again, usually that's as tall as you'll, you can't reach any higher. And they'll let these branches grow about five foot across or so, and that's going to be the most productive size you can make on these trees. So, that's. On this example, how many of those branches would you personally train down? Yeah, you only want one truly vertical, so it's nice to get all the other ones fairly horizontal. Yeah. Although, it looks like all of these... Pardon? Would you do like 10, 10 of the branches, or would you not worry about the top, or how would you treat that tree for training? The top is always a question of what you want to do, because the top gets a lot of sunlight, and you can probably leave it straight up, and it'll probably still fruit. But, uh, yeah. Well, this is a, that's, yeah. well, of course, the first thing you do is cut off the dead branches. So this plant did have some dead branches on it. It's interesting, a lot of healthy branches go right next to dead branches. So they grow out of that same spot. Then, you know, generally you cut off the dead branches, diseased branches, broken branches first to see what you have left to make sure you're not, you know, you're not leaving yourself with just dead branches. So that was on one side. Say if I did this side, we'll stub this one. That's broken. I mean, that's almost about it for this side of the tree. Um, yeah, so on 
trees that are supposed to go dormant, we notice that the soil temperature plays a big part of when they drop their leaves. So in a pot, they drop their leaves sooner than they do in the ground because the ground's still warm. So you, you, by the end of December, generally, they're, they're, they have dropped. Right. It was topped a couple of times. Okay, so if you wanted to bring it down again, you could get too high and you can't reach the fruit. Where would you cut that one? Well, if you, say if you wanted to cut it here, you cut it to a side branch. Right about here is fine. So go below where the last branch is. Well, right above uh, another existing branch is always a good place. Of course, with, again, with peaches, nectarines, it's nice never to have to prune a branch thicker than a pencil if you have a choice. Or if you do it, just do it when it's young. Don't you know? Don't prune. Thick, the thicker you cut, the more damage you do to this tree. I mean, on peaches, nectarines, we figure you cut a branch that's an inch in diameter, you got an inch of dead wood throughout in the middle of that tree from that point on. So, because they just don't seal wounds well at all. Yeah, you could have just kept cutting that one off as it grew so to keep it right. Because in theory, you can, you know, if this tree is, say, six foot tall and five foot wide, that's still a whole lot of fruit. In fact, uh, on plants that need winter chill, the shorter you keep them, the better the chill they get. Because the air is much colder at the ground than it is 10 foot off the ground. Because we notice that when we have lack of chill, the bottom branches on all our stone fruit trees fruit. The top ones don't because they're not getting the chill. So if you can bring the top down to where it's getting more chill, that's better. Yeah. Might as well. I mean, again, it's. There's no disadvantage to having, say, two trunks instead of one. It's just a little more complicated in the, in the branching that you have to figure. You don't want to have cross branching in there, so you just choose the branches going outwards. But essentially, you know, it doesn't really matter that much. You're just wasting the tree's energy to make four of them, but not a big deal. Right. Now, on, on cherry trees, Commercially now, they usually just do one trunk, let it grow 30 foot high, because they shake the cherries off them nowadays. But for a homeowner, yeah, you might want it shorter. Okay, so, oh, uh, peaches, nectarines uh, do require the most winter maintenance. So I brought these up. So generally, once the leaves are off, you want to hit it at least once in the winter with some kind of copper product. Um, like this one, you attach the hose, this one you just spray. We need to spray the buds on the branches with copper. This is li a liquid copper spray. There's copper Bordeaux. There's uh, Master Copper. There's quite a few products out there that'll work the same way. But sometime during the winter before they wake up, you want to spray them at least one time. If we have no rain at all, we've got quite. A, you know, we've already got about three or four inches this year. But if you get no rain, then there's no need. But if we get rain on these buds in the wintertime, what happens? They get this disease called peach leaf curl. And peach leaf curl, and all the new leaves come out. They look like they got red blisters all over them. The plant doesn't like that. Uh, after a few months, those are dropped and replaced by healthy leaves. But the plant wasted a lot of energy replacing its leaves. So that energy could have gone into better fruit. So it's nice, to, you know, it doesn't kill the tree. The peach leaf curl does not kill the tree. And I've had neighbors who've never treated their peach leaf curl, and they, their fruit looks okay, but it would have been better if they had treated it. So generally in the middle of winter, and these products have an a organic label, um, OMRI label on them. So even though they're not organic, they allow them to use some farms because, you know, it's the safest thing they can do to stop that problem. Sometime in the winter. So traditionally here we do it between Christmas and New Year's. Um, the most effective spraying you can do supposedly is right when the color starts showing in the flower buds. So they call that bud break or bud swell. That's supposed to be the most effective but 
I don't know, we, we just do it once in the middle of dead of winter and we don't see the peach leaf girl. So that's, that's usually good enough. Now commercially, because there's a lot of orchards in the Central Valley, they say they spray every five inches you go out and spray the orchards again because they can't afford to have peach leaf curl in a commercial orchard. It can mess up their entire crop if it's real bad. And they usually use something called lime sulfur. So if you go up to Fresno this time of year, or uh, I'd say in January, the whole place smells like sulfur. <laughs> We're not allowed, lime sulfur is supposed to be the best chemical to prevent peach leaf curl. We're not allowed to sell it because uh, the EPA says homeowners are not smart enough to handle this product. Of course, the EPA ruled that carbon dioxide is a pollutant, which is it's like the, I don't know, I don't trust them anymore after they did that. <laughs> I mean, we breathe carbon dioxide. What, you know, what? We're pollutants, we're polluters. Okay. When you spray the copper, do you ever like mix anything else with it? Like, is it like a pesticide or, or do you have like a paper one or do you usually do that kind of stuff? Well, yeah. So in the old days, we used to hit them, it used to always be an oil and copper mix. Um, we don't have to do the oil sprays in the winter anymore. So in the old days, the oil sprays would kill things that they didn't have any other chemicals for, like scale, uh, mealybugs. The oil had to be used, but in the old days, we're talking back in the 50s and 60s, the oils we had were so polluted, they had so much sulfur in them, that you spray them on the leaves of a tree, burn them all off. So the only time it was safe to do the oil sprays was in the dead of winter. Well, nowadays, the oil sprays that we have are so clean, you can spray them on the leaves just like salad oil, and they won't hurt the leaves. So you don't have to do an oil spray in the winter anymore, but you can. It just says horticultural and dormant oil spray. You can spray this any time of the year. If you want to spray it when you do the copper, you can. But well, you shouldn't spray when there's flowers, right? Uh, it doesn't hurt anything. I mean, we've, we've sprayed the copper on the flowers open and it didn't hurt them. So it's not going to hurt them. It's just not effective. Once, the, once they bloom, then you, this doesn't stop the peace we grow. It's already too late. So. It can. Well, it doesn't burn them uh, fatally. So if you spray neem oil uh, and it's the wrong time, like it's 100 degrees or if it's 50 degrees, the oil can burn the edge of the leaf. And some plants are real sensitive to neem. Neem is one of the dirtier oils because neem seeds essentially have a high sulfur content compared to a lot of other plants. Uh, and sulfur oil is a bad combination but it is, makes it quite effective against certain bugs and diseases. That oil and the sulfur really mess them up, but it can also damage the leaves a bit. But if you use neem in like the winter, is that safe? I, I have neem really bad. It is. The thing to know about neem is the first time I tried it was February. So I, I pour, and I keep my sprayer in a, in a little cabinet outside, so I pour it in a sprayer and it turns to gel. It gels at 55 degrees, so uh, in the winter time, what you have to do is you have to pour hot water in your sprayer first, then put the neem in there so the water's not so cold and the sprayer's not cold because, yeah, it just turns to gel. It just gels up. So at 55 degrees, it just goes solid. So, yeah, we learn a lot as we, from experience. <laughs> Well, we don't spray neem on our roses anymore because it would burn the edges of the leaves and the flower petals. I uh, don't think it'll hurt hibiscus, but you'll just have to try it. I mean, it doesn't hurt anything fatally. It's just cosmetic burning on the edges of things. So, And before, you know, a long time ago, before they added a, a scent to this, you spray neem over the nursery, no one could walk out there. It was nasty. It was really, it was like you're in a, next to a volcano. <laughs> then they added something just to take, I don't know if they took out some sulfur or added some fragrance to make it more pleasant, but they did something to it so it's not as bad as it used to be. So. The other thing we do with peaches, nectarines, just so you know, um, when they do bloom uh, late winter, early spring, I mean this year, 
Uh, we think that some of the peaches nectarine, well, some of the peaches will be blooming before January because we had that early cold. Uh, and some peaches need so little winter that they'll start blooming. So when they bloom, it's nice to hit the flowers with a spinel set like Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. There's many uh, companies that make Spinosad products, but Spinosad is an organic, considered organic. It controls chewing insects and peaches and nectarines. They do have problems with a critter called the um, oriental fruit moth. And it's a very interesting critter because it overwinters as a caterpillar at the ends of stems. Now we've sprayed these trees, so I may not have any at all. But a lot of times at the end of a branch on a peach or a nectarine or a nectar plum, you'll see it's all gummy and black and swollen. And there's actually caterpillar hibernating in there. Like here's a swollen joint right on this branch here. It's a little swollen right there. So there's probably a caterpillar inside that joint. Maybe right here too, this is a little swollen here, but sometimes they get gummy too. And the caterpillars overwinter inside the branch. They actually eat the wood and the new shoots. And then they wake up when they bloom and the first thing they do is eat the flower petals. And then they, as new growth comes out, they drill, uh, they drill into those and eat them out. It doesn't do a whole lot of damage. It's like someone's going around your tree trimming off the tips. But the problem with that bug is the third generation. So the, you know, the moths, the adult moth is real tiny, a little tiny tan colored moth that flies around. But they, the larvae go drill right into the stem into the fruit. So you cannot tell that they're inside the fruit from looking at the fruit because they went through the stem. So you get your fruit, you take a bite, and there's this worm right at the pit. And that's the oriental fruit moth. So to prevent that, you, you can stop the first generation just by spraying them when they bloom because they're eating the flower petals. But anytime you see the end of the branch just suddenly wilt and you lose a few leaves, they're in there. So if your neighbor doesn't spray their trees, you're going to have to spray your trees, say, every month or two during the spring to stop that drilling of the tips and then keep them out of the fruit. Is that the flagging? Yeah. Flagging of, they call it flagging when you lose the top, the tip leaves on a branch of peaches, nectarines. Occasionally you'll see a plum leaves do that, uh, pleury leaves, and then that bug is drilling them out. But it's primarily a, a, a problem with peaches and nectarines that ripen in July. Um, that third generation in July does it. The peaches are ripen in May and June. We don't see any worms in there. It's that, I don't know, it's weird. It's that third generation that's programmed to go into the fruit. There's five generations a year of oriental fruit moth. There's a... Persimmon? Yeah. It's in its own family. Yeah, it's still the ultimate, the best size for that tree is about five foot wide and say seven or eight foot tall. I mean, when I was back in the 80s, I had a Fuyu persimmon that was this big and this tall, and it wouldn't grow any bigger because it was making over 100 fruit a year on that size of tree. <laughs> yeah, persimmon's, pers persimmon's pretty amazing. It can produce a lot of fruit. Okay, so the peaches, nectarines. Now, apples and pears, even though we want them to do the same thing, um, the difference is, is that their branches live a long time. And they fruit off these little short stubs. So on apples and pears, you want the horizontal branching. You want them to be about a foot apart, the same as on a peach tree. But once you have this branch here, this branch will be productive for over a decade. 
and you can let it go a little, you know, uh, well, I'll say again, about two to three foot long is as, as the best efficiency you can have for the size of this tree. And again, if you want it to grow longer, you've got to keep the tip pointed up a little bit. And as it grows, you lay it down flat, and then it makes all these little side uh, fruiting spurs, they call them. And those spurs can be productive for, each spur can be productive for five to ten years. Anywhere you want to cut it is fine, because apples do not get damaged by pruning, <laughs> or minimal damage. So again, spacing, you want them about a foot between layers of branches. So apples and pears much easier. Now apples and pears, their biggest problem is fire blight. Fire blight is a disease, it's a bacterial infection that they can get. Usually it comes in by way of bees. So bees are the good guys, but they can carry fire blight with them, which is a bacterial infection that goes inside the flower. So on, I didn't bring the product up here. Let me just grab a product off her shelf. So apples and pears, one of the things, if you want to make sure that you don't get fire blight, this product called Garden Foss. Even if you like growing things organically, this is not so bad. I mean, in many states, in fact, I said, I think the majority of states, Garden Foss is registered not as a fungicide, but as a fertilizer. It's uh, mono and dipotassium salts of phosphorus acid, and both potassium and phosphorus are fertilizers. It's just that this really beefs up the phosphorus content of the sap of the plant, and phosphorus is one of the minerals they need to fight off diseases. And when this first came out, is one of the, it's interesting, the University of California sent all the nurseries letters promoting this product because they said they've seen it do amazing things so like root rot and avocado trees, they said you inject this into a almost totally dead avocado, brings it back to life. So avocado orchards buy this in big quantities and they said they run it through the irrigation cycle once every month or so to keep the trees real healthy, keeps the root rot away from the trees. But it also fights fire blight pretty well. And on apples and pears, brought a pear tree in too, But either way, it can be injected. You know, injection into the trunk is the most efficient, but we don't work with injectors. So they have instructions for applying it on the foliage, and they have uh, instructions for pouring the dirt, and they also have instructions for just painting the trunk. So in the wintertime, uh, the easiest way is just to mix this one-to-one one -one with water and paint the trunk and lower branches of the apples and the pear trees, and I'll get enough of this in there that even if a bee brings the fire blight to your flowers, uh, it pretty much stops it. Now, you don't have to do that. You can just watch your flowers carefully. So normally on a, when they bloom in the spring, the flowers are white and they shrivel up kind of light tan maybe and then drop off. But if the flower petals turn black on you, you know it's fire blight. You just break off that entire little spur and that'll stop it. Once it gets into the stem, it starts going down the stem, almost like gangrene, and you've got to clip it off. They say to clip it 18 inches beyond the point, but sometimes that's down here. So just clip off what you see, and if there's no discoloration in the wood that you clipped off, you've, you've cleaned it up. It's all fire blight, right. And the pruners can spread it too, so every time you make a cut, clean your pruners off with the bleach. Um, 2006 was a real bad year in my yard. It's the only year I've ever seen fire blight on my apple trees, but 2005 was an El Nino, and 2007 was an El Nino. 2006 was a, a mild year between the two, but boy, we got hit real bad on all our apple trees. My apple trees were like about eight years old. No, nah, they're younger than that, maybe five years old. 
Well, that wasn't 2000, that was 1996. So 90, 1995 was an El Nino, and then 97 was an El Nino, 98 was an El Nino, and the 96 year we got, our apple trees got hit, and they were very young at that time. And certain apples are more immune, and certain apples are more susceptible. So Granny Smith laughs at fire blight. Gala totally gets destroyed by it. So I had my Gala apple tree was, in, was next to the Granny Smith, Whole t all the branches were turning black, it was dying down. So the only thing I can do with it is cut it to about two feet. Cut the whole top of that tree off to save it. Grew back, grew back within six months to the same size, but I lost the crop for that year. It fruited the next year, so it's not a big deal. But, um, so you have to, so that at that point I said, okay, next year I'm spraying it with this. Of course, it never happened again, so I stopped spraying it after a while, but that was a bad year, the 96. So you may not see fire blight, but if it happens, and if you see black branches, uh, pear trees generally get a lot of fire blight. Apple trees, not as bad unless you have gala. Uh, but pear trees get fire blight pretty easily. So if you have a pear in your yard, then you're spraying your apples too. Like this branch here is pretty black. It might have gotten fire blight on it. So the way bees spread fire blight it's when you have an infected branch and it gets hit by rain and fall and winter, the fungus starts oozing out of that dead stem. I mean, the stem is dead, but the fungus is in there and it's oozing out what looks like honey. And the bees look at that and they go, well, what is that? It's not honey, but they touch it and then they go to a flower and it spreads. So you want to get rid of all the branches that are turned black because that's, as soon as the rain gets to them, they start oozing all this stuff out and then the bees spread that to the healthy parts of the tree. If you're in the fire blight area, use bleach. So on this pear tree, you know, unfortunately pears like to grow, every branch wants to be the central leader for a long time. So, I mean this is, uh, it's not stiff enough, you can make it go sideways. So in the old days, you know, there's printing books around that were written in the 1950s. Don't buy those. Because what they would tell you to do on a pear tree, and on apple trees too, is instead of bending the branches down, they would tell you, oh, let them grow taller and taller and taller. And then when they get it long enough, the weight would pull them down and then they would start producing. Or they told you to cut them to an outside bud to make the branch go sideways. So in the 1980s, one of my first apple trees I had, everything went straight up. So they said, oh, prune to an outside bud. Prune to an outside bud, got the same branch the next year. So I spent like five years pruning to an outside bud, and the tree looked the same after five years. It didn't, it didn't solve any problems. So you got to, you know, the, all I had to do was pull the branch down, and it would have been productive. But here I got like one apple at the top of each branch, and that's it. So it wasn't helping me at all. Um, so the old books aren't so good. So kind of a study of the effective. Mm-hmm. Or just tie them down. Yeah, tie them down. So what pear produces around here? This is hood, which is from Florida. There's several Florida pears. Hood, uh, kefir pear is the one we're promoting now. We think kefir pear might be a little better coy than hood. Kefir. That's another subject, but so pears and apples, um, you know, layer them out, and you'll get your fruiting spurs going. Um, I mean, when apple trees are young and pear trees are young, usually just the tips of each branch fruit, and as they get older, the fruiting spurs all form in the in the interior of the tree, and then you get your your heavier production and better quality fruit. Because usually, if they form at the tips of the branch. They sunburn. So is that sort of the, um, like the first tree we're looking at, like fruits on new wood? Is it more like an old wood type fruiting? Well, it's all uh, first year growth, but on short branches. So this is an old branch, but this is still first year growth. Wherever there's a leaf, that's still considered first year wood. Or 
uh, next year it'll be considered second year wood. That's where the fruit forms on this. So there had to be a leaf there last year to get flowers there this coming year. But in this case, yeah, it's an old branch. All this just short new growth on each of those spurs. Now this pear tree, the other reason I don't promote it as much because Hood easily put on my house 15 foot of growth straight up every year. It's just hard to control that one. It's just too vigorous. Pears weren't bad though. I mean, I was, I can, I remember the, um, well, five years ago when we had the real hot winters, she was making like 500 pears a year on this tree in my backyard. I couldn't believe it. No winter, more pears. Whereas all my other fruit trees were suffering, the, the Florida pears were going to town. <laughs> okay, um, well, let's go stay in the stone fruit for a little bit longer here. Uh, this is a plum tree. Typical plums. So plums, uh, even though they fruit on new wood, or one-year-old growth, they do, similar to apples and pears, they make these little short side branches. You can see them all along these stems. Now this is like three years old, so it's doing it. On a younger plum tree, you won't see that. But they make all these short spurs. And generally on plum trees, they want the branching to be about 45 degree angle. or a good fan shape, let's say that. A good fan shape so that there's room for the light to get in there. So what they, the main thing they do on these trees to keep them productive is keep thinning them out. Now this tree being so young, you don't have to do this yet, but as it gets bigger, say if it's a good five foot across and eight foot tall, it's nice to have the branching so that there's light in there so they say to cut out entire branches in between others to let the light in there because you still need to grow inside the tree to get the fruit production in there. If it gets too dense they can only make it on the outside and then you have to let the tree get bigger and bigger and bigger or else you can't get any fruit. So keep thinning it out inside the tree so the sunlight gets in there. Like here you got two branches so close together you might as well just cut one of those off because they both can't be productive. In this case I will prune the taller one because this has fruiting spurs on it. And here you got these two branches, they're real close too, so I'm also cut off the taller one and save that one. So just give them some room. In fact, I'm gonna get rid of the tall one there. This should all produce here. And I'll cut this one, this one's crossing through the middle. Get rid of that. So they got more room to get the light in there. So you're trying to keep the tree growing within the dimensions you want, which is say five foot, six foot wide, and maybe eight foot tall. So do most of your height control all summer. If you do it, you know, because if you do it now, the best flower buds may be at the very tip, and then you cut it off and you don't get any fruit on that branch at all. So again, they'll make flower buds at the tip of each branch, whether it be a long branch or just a short stub, they make flower buds at the tips. Yeah, but normally they don't fruit on tall ones. So, you know, even in spring, you'll see these branches going straight up real high. You can just cut them off, there's no fruit on there. That's always a question. You know, that's always a good one. Uh, yeah, it's hard to predict. So you would let them go until they assume a more natural shape? Well, you can, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with this shape. It would have been more, you know, a more, what you could say, um, efficient if there's only one trunk. But this is okay. There's no, there's no problem with that. I'd, I'd keep that the way it is. Well, I mean, it's, this is stone fruit, so the pruning you do is going to shorten the life of the tree. Generally, plum trees make it to about 30, 40 max. But if you do a lot of pruning on bigger branches, you'll shorten the life of the tree. 
So Now on plums, apricots, we do about the same way. Pluots, pluries, pretty much the same way. So a fan ice, fan shape. Now we notice on most of these, like on plum trees, what happens to them is that every time they have a crop, the branch gets weighed down a little bit. And it gets weighed down a little more. And eventually it's too low. You cut it off. The, all these branches are doing the same thing. They're all slowly weeping down, and the tree makes new ones through the middle. So that's generally what they do now. If you keep them real small, they may never get heavy enough to weigh it down. So you just work with a smaller tree. But on the, I've had big trees where the branches would have so much fruit that they would just go down below horizontally, get rid of them. Okay, now figs totally different. So figs, you can prune it during the year if you're getting too tall, but generally we just do them in the winter time. So let's assume, well, like on this branch, this is what grew this year. From here to here is what grew this year and it had fruit on it. Um, so all the, these are all branches that grew this year. This one, on this branch, they only grew this part here. This is two years old, that's one year old. On this branch, in fact, on this branch, this is one year old, this is two years old. And this one, this one might be the same thing. This may be last year's wood, and this is this year's wood. Now figs, to play it safe, you want to leave a little bit of this year's wood. I believe on figs, though, second year wood also yields a branch that fruits too. So in other words, on this branch, this is one year old wood. Now, this tree is not too big. I mean, there's no reason to prune it. But on a lot of fig trees, especially like Black Mission, this branch here, they could have grown 12 foot this year. It'd be way up there. So what you do is in winter time, you come and cut it down to, it, to the last node on this branch. Notice where a leaf was attached. There's a leaf scar where the leaf fell off in a ring around the branch right at that point. And right above the leaf scar is the bud that can make a new branch with fruit on it. So you want to, you can, all you have to do is leave the last leaf scar, which is right here. You cut it right above there. A new branch will come out right there with fruit on it this coming year. Now this trunk is probably five years old, well, four years old. If you cut it down to here, you'll get branches coming out but no fruit on them this coming year because this branch is too old to fruit off of. We've tried it with two-year-old branches, and we, most times they still will fruit new growth off a two-year-old branch. But once you get to three years, four years old, uh, the new growth coming off there doesn't fruit anymore. But to play it safe, it's nice to always, every year, especially if it's a vigorous fig like a black mission, cut it down to the last node, or some people say two nodes, just to make sure, two nodes on this branch. And then you get this big old stub in the ground. Every, you know, on a 20-year-old tree, you have this big old stubby trunk with short little branches sticking out the top of it. And that's what they look like. A lot of orchards in the wintertime look like that. And then every year they grow out 10 foot and then they cut them back down to almost the same spot every winter. How about, Gary, how about uh, violets and Bordeaux? Well, a lot of the dwarf figs, you know, like this fig, this branch, I wouldn't cut it. It's just not long enough to need to cut. Now, the advantage of leaving short branches is there's little tiny figs on here that never fruited, that never developed this year. They'll develop next spring. Because uh, they didn't, it was too, it was too close to the winter, so the tree decided not to make that fruit. So there's a little tiny fruit forming there, and that's your spring crop. Is at the tips of each branch. The spring crop are the largest figs, and maybe the best quality too. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not, but they're usually the biggest figs. There's a few fig trees that never make a spring crop, but most figs can. So if you leave the short branches alone, you'll get your spring crop. But if they're too long, this clip them down and then you'll get new branches with fruit on it that start forming in summer. So that's your summer fall crop. Yes. So I have blackjack and I have brown turkey and I have them as spalliated. So when I spalliated those dappled green branches, do I need to be trading those out as it's been aging? 
Well, the scaffolding branch, you can grow it back again. You can just cut it down back to its or where it originated and then regrow it in the same. It's a pain, though. <laughs> I'd have to train it again. Yeah, I haven't tried to espalier a spalier or fig before, but of course, yeah, of course, I think on blackjack, your, your growth is very short anyway, just like this little branch here grew this year and it still had figs on it, so like I, the shorter ones, uh, blackjack, Violet de Bordeaux, Panache, a lot of those trees, you just don't have to prune them because they only grow like, you know, they might grow this much a year and have figs all along that. And you have so many little branches, they're all covered with figs. Well, Black Jack is like, goes crazy growing. And uh, all summer, you can get more, so many and trees, I produce and keep producing. And, and, and they, they all look like spring growth. So I can keep cutting it back. I've been cutting it back because I can't even reach it in summer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Green beetles. <laughs> the fig beetles. Well, there are you know, well, there are problems with some figs. So this fig here, um, what is this one? It's a closed eye fig, so the bugs can't get in the eye. Some figs have big open eyes, and you can't do anything about them, like panache and white genoa. They have big open eyes, and things get in there, and, and a lot of times we lose the entire crop because the bugs introduce mold in there. So we, we quit selling white genoas 30 years ago because we couldn't stop it. Uh, panache we still carry even though some years we get that mold because it's such a f good tasting fig. No one wants to give up on that one. But we try to find figs that don't have an open eye and then they don't get that mold inside of them. The open eye is for figs that need to be pollinated but most of the figs we grow don't need the pollination. Uh, but some figs still retain the open eye. <clears throat> this is mouse damage there. I can see the teeth marks. So, yeah, Kadoda is a big tree, so you just cut it, cut it short every winter. And you know, uh, figs pretty, pretty good about pruning wounds. So if you need to cut a 30 footer down to a foot, go ahead and do it. It'll resprout. You lose crop for one year, and then you'll be fine. Figs live a long time. I never have. Now figs do have, you know, figs like the Mediterranean climate like our climate because they don't like rain on their leaves. Every time it rains they get rust and the leaves fall off and they have to regrow new ones. One of our customers lives in the Philippines half the year and, can, and lives here half the year and he says he's taken our, he, he smuggles them <laughs> to the Philippines and he says there they fruit year round. They never stop. They don't need any cold. They just fruit year round. But if they have a real nasty monsoonal year, kills the tree. He says they put out leaves, they die, puts out new leaves, they die, puts out over and over and over until the tree gives up and dies. So then he has to take new fig trees to the Philippines every few years to replace the ones that die. But he says, yeah, they fruit year round. They don't need the winter. So. Well, the first line of defense on rats and mice is bubble gum. So get go down and get double bubble gubble gum, a bag of it's like seven, eight dollars. Unwrap and put them around. Uh, if your dog eats it, nothing happens. If a rat eats it, it's, it's like you eating this much bubble gum. It doesn't digest. You'll starve to death in a few days. Um, we didn't think it would work until we tried it. We said, this can't work. But two days after we put out, I think about a dozen pieces of bubble gum, we found two dead rats and a dead mouse laying on the sidewalk. We couldn't believe it. We go, that that's a lot better, faster working than the poisons they put out. So you open it and put it on the ground. We put it on the wall so our dog didn't eat them all. Oh. <laughs> Did you say it worked for gophers? Uh, gophers, yeah, we've been told it works on gophers. Uh, it's got to be sugar, not sugarless, but sugary gum. Um, double bubble is what most people get, it's cheaper. 
but um, doesn't seem to work well on squirrels, unfortunately. But rats and mice and gophers, not all rats and mice will eat them, but you'll get a whole bunch of them. And it's safer for birds and other predators to have the gum. Most no, cats are pretty smart. Dogs are kind of dumb. <clears throat> okay, uh, mulberries are related to figs, and you treat them almost the same way. You don't have, you know, a lot of mulberries um, are slow growing, and you don't have to trim at all. But like this is a white mulberry called Pakistan. It'll grow 20 feet in a year. So what we would do, now this whole plant from here up is one year old. So you can cut anywhere and whatever branch comes off here will have fruit on it. Um, but generally, um, like on this mulberry, in fact most mulberries, the wood's got to be a little thicker to get a good crop. So this one's not, this one may or may not fruit this coming year. It's not quite thick enough yet. Once they get a certain size, then all the stuff uh, that's got uh, year old growth on it will start uh, flowering and fruiting. But I, I would probably cut this down to about here and maybe here and here and just leave these shorter. Um, and then whatever comes off, it hopefully we'll get some fruit this year. You might get just a few, but when they get older, you know, when the trunks are like this, they fruit like crazy. Now, just so you know, on mulberries, normally they put on one crop a year. But we found out that uh, by accident that you can make them crop three or four times a year off the same tree. So what happened was someone had bought a, uh, a mulberry from us and didn't like the fruit. So they pulled it out of the ground and brought it back. I thought, well, boy, that, you know. <laughs> so we put it back in a pot and it was in shock so all the leaves fell off. And this was like July after it fruited. So it, what it did was two weeks later, it wanted to relief, but to relief it has to bloom first. So it made another crop. We're going, okay, this is interesting. So at my house, we had one of these mulberry trees in a big pot. We said, okay, let's try this. So after it fruited, and those fruit around May or June, strip all the leaf off of one branch, and within two weeks, the branch flowered and made another crop. So we tried it over and over and over on different branches. I think fruited like four times that year. So uh, mulberries, you know, our season here for a mulberry tree is almost year round. So, you know, in, in parts of nature where they come from, it's a shorter season. So they just make one crop. But here you can make them crop over and over and over. Yeah, they can't have any leaves. The leaves inhibit growth. Each leaf on a plant, the tip of the branch puts out, you know, I should have mentioned this on pruning, the tip of the branch puts out hormones that prevents things below it from sprouting. Each leaf does the same. Each leaf makes hormones that prevents the, the leaf, the bud at the base of the, the leaf to sprout. But you remove that, so you cut off the top of this branch, all the hormones coming down this branch are gone, so the top bud is free to sprout pull off the leaves and there's no hormones at all stopping the bud at the base of the leaf from opening up. Now in a mulberry, what triggers them to grow is warm temperatures and no leaves. So if it's warm and there's no leaves to stop the growth, all the buds open up and start growing. They don't need cold to trigger them. So like on a plum, any stone fruit, each bud on here is being inhibited by a, a chemical that stops them from growing uh, due to, they ha and the cold <coughs> kills that chemical. So they have to be exposed to a minimum number of hours in the winter for this bud to open up next spring and make flowers and leaves. If they don't have it, they'll stay sleeping all the way into midsummer, and they'll finally put out a few leaves and a few flowers because it's already summer. But uh, to make a normal crop on this tree, each bud, each flower bud and leaf bud has to be exposed to a certain amount of cold before it completes production. Mulberries don't have that. All they need is warm temperatures and no leaves. So if these leaves are preventing next year's growth from opening up right now, if I strip them off, it starts growing immediately. Now it's getting a little cold now, so it may not. 
but uh, anytime you have a heat wave in the middle of winter, a lot of the mulberries start waking up right there. Figs don't need cold either. They just, you know, again, in the Philippines, they just grow year-round and fruit year-round. In fact, the only trees we find that need a chill, stone fruit, that's apricots, cherries, almonds, peaches, plums, pluries, uh, pears seem to need a chill. Apples don't have to have it. Um, they seem to wake up by June no matter what. So they don't seem to have to have the chill, although some apples work better if they have a chill. They make bigger fruit, better, a little better quality if they have the chill, but they don't need it. Um, jujubes don't need it, persimmons don't need it. We found that out in 2013, no winter that year. Uh, everything woke up in January. We couldn't believe it. Persimmons, jujubes, figs, everything was up and blooming and fruiting in the middle of winter. The stone fruit suffered, but uh, mo a lot of most of the other fruit trees didn't seem to need that winter. Uh, you might still get a crop. These fruit may make it. I mean, to to lose a crop. Okay, well that's the problem. Yeah, the the thing about stone fruit, if they wake up this time of year, you know, if if it was in Fresno and woke up this time of year, it gets too cold and that frost would kill the the blooms and the fruit. Here, we don't, we may not get cold enough to kill any new new growth. So. True. So hopefully you don't blew them out right now. <laughs> Well, you need to, well mul being mulberry you need to get thicker. Yeah. Yeah. If it's only two years old, it's not that old yet. So you might let it get a little bigger first. Well, you can cut it down and but just don't cut it down too low. You want to cut it down to where you want the fruiting branches to form. Yeah. Because we've seen a lot of mulberries that are too young to fruit. Yeah, but they're already like 30 foot tall. <laughs> so what do you do? Yeah, they're getting the branches sweeter than fruit. The reason I ask is we have a black fruit, a black one, and it's a bush to bush variety. And I don't know if you can tell the berries. Well, we had a problem this year in that we didn't have any heat until August. This was a very cool year. So, uh, I mean, most of the grapes got mildew. You know, is this not, not a very good year? So, I mean, that might be our future, though. <laughs> but generally, uh, usually July is warmer, but this year July was even cool. Okay, so this is pomegranate. Now, <coughs> pomegranates, there's so much growth on a pomegranate tree, you don't have to be that careful how you prune it. Um, so generally, they don't worry about where you prune it, but how much wood you keep. So pomegranates, as with mulberries, the thicker the branches, the better they fruit. And generally, uh, we've read that pomegranate orchards, generally the owners or the managers work, some managers like one trunk, some like up to eight. So one to eight is the range of, of stems from the dirt to use, but if you get too much, too many trunks, they all stay too skinny, you don't get much crop. So it's better to thin them down a little bit and make sure they're not making too much. I mean, pomegranates, similar to olive trees, when they're young, they'll get masses of new branches from the dirt. And you just got to keep hedging that off, just trim that out of there. I mean, they'll make, you know, 100 new trunks coming out of the ground. Just keep mowing them down. And after about five, 10 years, they stop doing that. And then you work, just work with the top after that. And with pomegranates, there's no real rules there because there's so many little branches that they, and they all can make fruit. 
this trim, most orchards say they trim back down to about six to eight foot size and let them regrow two or three foot and they'll have fruit there. No, the water didn't hurt them. Uh, just, well, this year, again, the clouds prevent the fruiting. So the more, the, the darker spring is, the fewer fruit you get on a pomegranate. Because we noticed, um, you know, like 2014 was a real hot spring. Really hot, 90 degrees all spring long. We had pomegranate trees this big making fruit that year. In fact, I would say out of all the little tiny, you know, second-year-old, two-year-old pomegranate trees we had, 80% of them had fruit on them. And the next year we had a, a spring that was just as bad as this last one, just totally fogged in. Only, we can only get two fruit on all our pomegranate. We had like 80 pomegranate trees, only two fruit. Because the, the clouds were just so nasty that year, they couldn't get any energy. So sunlight makes a difference and age makes it. The older the tree is, thicker the branches, the more fruit. But the early heat makes a huge difference. We think on pomegranates and persimmons, those two, you don't have any heat in the spring, you don't get any fruit. So, um, That's what was so weird. My pomegranate had no fruit this year, but last year it had 400. My persimmon right next to it had no fruit last year, but I picked 325. Okay, so the other thing that fruit trees do, and this is a good point with, with pomegranates, uh, persimmons, is that if they get a heavy crop one year, they've used up all the energy and they can't even make a flower bud the next year. So they go into alternate, avocados are known to do that too. So they get, if you have too much fruit one year, and tangerines are real famous for that too. Like if there's like 10 fruit on one branch, there's just no energy left. So the next spring, they don't bloom. But because of that, no fruit for one year, the fruit, the branches have so much energy that they overcrop the next year. You get, you know, f you know, flood, famine, flood, famine, just over and over and over. So to prevent that, around mid-spring of the year when you have too much fruit, cut off two-thirds of it. Don't let it develop. Non -pers yes. Oh yeah, you can you can make pers pomegranates in the hedges. Well, the only thing the only thing you can do, well, there's two things you can do. One thing would be to wa make sure they're amply watered, because lack of water will make them abort fruit. So even though pomegranates in general are drought-resistant plants, the fruit is not. And we notice that they can handle water because in my yard, my last house, we put our pomegranates in a low spot. It turned out to be the lake of the yard. So when we had the El Ninos in the 90s, um, they were just sitting in water till summer. Fruit was fabulous. We couldn't believe it. We, we thought that would kill them, but they actually thrived underwater. <laughs> so... So the pomegranates, lots of water is one thing, so keep them well watered. Um, they also are a little better if they're cross-pollinated. So in, an, in a pomegranate orchard, they always have two kinds of pomegranates next to each other, kind of alternating so that the bees and the birds, I mean, often one tree will be enough, but you'll get more fruit and more production if they're cross-pollinated. They they're not so happy with their own pollen. One kind's enough, well, it's partially self-fertile, put it that way. It's partially self-fertile, so t two kinds of pomegranates will give you more fruit on each tree than one, than two of the same trees, put it that way. Is this a thornless pomegranate? No, it's pretty spiky. I mean, it's the branch tips that are spiny. They don't really have, quote, thorns, but their branches are pretty spiny. Now I will mention, since we're here, we're, that we grow a pomegranate that's evergreen and produces fruit year-round. Our, our crop will probably be ready this spring. Um, 
but it fly, it's a tropical version um, and it flowers year round. Can you talk about uh, mango tree here? Well, mangoes, there's not much to do pruning wise. Um, we noticed that mangoes that the hanging branches fruit better than the upright ones. So when they're young, you know, if you grow a mango from seed, everything's upright and nothing fruits because it's too juvenile. And then as it matures, the branches turn over and start coming back down. Then they start fruiting and, and producing fruit. If they're grafted, they just flower and fruit no matter what. Um, I don't know that there's any big technique on thinning out or or pruning mangoes or avocados or citrus. They're just all generally just shaped. You know, a, a dome shape is more productive than a vase shape. So you just try to keep them in a, in a somewhat of a dome, but mangoes do that automatically. You know, they do that on their own. And most citrus do that too. They're fairly dome shaped. So with citrus, would you be, like where you're saying, uh, every foot still thin it out for better production? No, you don't have to. If you keep it into a dome, the dome is the perfect, the most, now, if you, if you let it go real big, then yeah, if you thin it out in between to get the light in there, that helps. But if you keep it small, you don't have to do that, that part. But yeah, that's the other thing. If you have a real big citrus tree, you take whole branches out and increases the sunlight penetration and the interior makes more fruit. Is that what you want to do with avocado? Like keep it small? Right. Small avocados produce a lot of fruit. I mean, I. I never thought uh, small avocado trees can do it until my friend had one in a 24 inch box. It was about six foot wide and maybe four foot tall. 80 avocados on that thing. <laughs> I couldn't believe they would fruit that heavily in that small size until I saw that thing. So now so I tell people, oh, you can grow avocados in pots. <laughs> I thought they were real light producers, but 80 fruit in a 24 inch box is pretty good, darn good. Yes. I don't know too much about water apples, but they're, that's a tropical, I don't know that you'd have to do much pruning on it. This sh you know, again, a round shape is most effective. <clears throat> well, uh, water apples, if you're talking about the, is it the red waxy fruit? Okay, uh, if, it was, uh, if it was seed grown, it might take five or six years or even 10 years to fruit. If it was, air, if it was cutting grown, then it can fruit uh, within a year or so. But if it was seed grown, it might take, I don't, I don't know that one. I know some of its relatives take four years to start production from seed, but that one might take, I don't know if that takes longer or not. Because they're not real happy in our climate. They we're a little cold here, so they may take longer. How old are the trees when they're sold in these pots? Is that like an apple or a peach or something? Well, uh, we, get, we got this one bare root a year ago. And uh, when we get them bare root, they're, it's about a year and a half after grafting. The roots are two years old. The top of the tree is about a year and a half old. <clears throat> and this one's now a year later, so the top of this one now is what uh, two and a half, two and a half years old. So it's still pretty young. Um, this fig again is about four or five years old. This plum tree is about. We've had that in the pot, probably three years now. So it's uh, it'd be a five-year-old plum tree. Any other questions? I didn't cover all the different fruit trees, so if you have if questions. Cut this off when we take about six feet high, it's okay. Well, yeah, six foot is probably a good size for mulberry. For mulberry. Yeah, develop fruiting branches so you can reach the fruit. Reach them, right? Because it's right. grown so tall, so pretty. I didn't realize when I bought it, I don't need to do it so tall. Can you recommend it to the feed the trees? Is it all different? Well, uh, if the tree is a baby tree, you feed it a lot just to get it up to size. But once it's big enough to fruit, once you get it to your size you want to fruit at, they don't need much. 
uh, good organic mulch on the ground may be fine because for most fruit trees, fertilizer doesn't make them fruit heavier. Um, now there's certain things you can do like make sure there's enough potassium around to make the fruit larger and juicier because potassium is the juice of the fruit. But nitrogen is for growth. You may not want your tree to grow anymore. Um, Again, again, just a good mulch on the ground provides adequate nitrogen just to get the same leaves back. But if you want to grow bigger, if you buy a very small avocado tree, say you want to feed that a lot of nitrogen fertilizer until it gets at least six or eight foot tall and wide, and then at that point you can pretty much stop feeding it minimal fertilizer at that point to get the fruit. Most fertilizers don't do much right now and, unless it's a citrus. So citrus, uh, traditionally, they're f heavily fertilized from January on. Now, I, I don't know if there's any new research on citrus because avocados, they say, on a mature avocado tree, don't starve it. Starve it until the fruit forms. Don't feed it because you, and it makes sense. If you feed a tree nitrogen, it uses the stored energy to make leaves which might make it drop its fruit. So they say starve it to make it uh, until you see the fruit formed and then feed it and that time would be summer. You feed avocados in the summertime if you need to feed them at all. Citrus are telling us to feed it in the winter before they even flower and it makes more flowers and foliage and more fruit. I don't know if anyone's ever done a test on that to see if that's true or not. If feeding it real early like that promotes more fruiting or does it promote more leaves? But uh, traditionally, citrus has always been fertilized January through July for oranges, tangerines, grapefruit, and year-round for lemons and limes. So we have a guava tree, which is probably two years old. It's about twelve to thirteen feet high, and the trunk is this thick, but no fruit. You, do you do you know if you grew it from seed or was it a? No, no, we bought it from here. Mm -hmm. I probably Vietnamese uh, guava Well, uh, generally what we do with guava is come down to about six feet in the winter, so you can reach the fruit. But they should fruit well. Seed-grown trees sometimes take longer. I know a guava tree in my house, I think it fruited its fourth year. Sometimes they fruit sooner, but fourth year would be about right. Most things we sell here are not seed-grown, right? It's not no, we sell a lot of seed-grown trees. Guavas are all, the guavas we've been selling, most of them have been seed-grown, but we did get some uh, cutting-grown ones this year, too. So we need to cut it down? Well, to keep it reasonable height, yeah, about six foot is a good size. As far as I know, they don't seem to have a short life. But I, I don't know, I haven't done that much research in the guavas. I have a uh, mature hoss, which I fed in September. Should I feed it in January prior to flowering in March or so? No, you're supposed to feed the hass in uh, summer, if you, if you feed it at all. Okay, then leave it alone until after it's fully set. Right. That's what they say, starve them when they're blooming. Yeah, okay. So. Thank you. Now, just as a side note, if you wanted to prune an avocado severely, so back when there was a drought, they said a lot of the orchards in San Diego did this because they didn't have any water, they weren't allocated any water. So they just stumped their avocado trees to four feet with a chainsaw. Now, I did bring a chainsaw in here because, you know, they say pruners are fine, Chainsaws are too coarse, but I don't know. As we get older, chainsaws become the tool to use. So um, anyway, so they most of the orchards were sawed off at four feet, just stumped in the winter. And then what happens is the trees don't grow for about three or four months, and then they take off and get their leaves back. But for three or four months, they don't require any water. In fact, for the entire year, you get very minimal water because the tree's a lot smaller, so they just stumped them in the winter time. 
And when you stump an avocado tree, um, in theory, you should paint the trunk white because the trunk sometimes is subject to sunburning if it gets too hot. So they said, uh, mo in, in fact, in the old days, that was common practice in avocado trees. Let them grow until you couldn't reach the fruit, stump them down to four feet, and within, by the end of the year, they're back up to about eight foot high and six foot wide, and then they flower the next year and, and start another crop. So it would stop, uh, what, uh, one year, what, two years of fruiting if you stump them in the winter. Okay, I think that's everything. Thank you.